Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I am joined here today by uh, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr Nicola Steedman, who will say a few words uh, shortly. Um, I will start, though, with the usual run-through of the daily statistics. Um, an additional 175 positive cases were confirmed yesterday. That represents 2.7% of people who were newly tested yesterday, and the total number of cases uh, is now 22,214. 80 of today's cases are in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, 39 in Lanarkshire, 24 in Lothian and 12 in Ayrshire and Arran. The remaining 20 cases are spread across another six health board areas. Now, I should flag up that the situation in Lanarkshire is causing some particular concern today. There will be expert public health discussions over the course of today and depending on the judgments and conclusions that they arrive at, it may be that some additional restrictions will have to be applied there. We will, however, keep people updated. I can also confirm that 269 patients are currently in hospital with confirmed COVID. That's three more than yesterday. Eight people are in intensive care. That's one more than yesterday. Uh, but I'm pleased to say that in the past 24 hours, no deaths were registered of patients who had tested positive. And the total number of deaths under that measurement therefore remains 2,499. Of course, that total always reminds us that this virus has had a terrible impact. And I want again to convey my condolences to everybody who has lost someone. Uh, today, I want to focus um, on the two key announcements that we made yesterday, just to underline uh, the importance of both. Uh, firstly, the Protect Scotland app, uh, as you've probably heard, launched yesterday. It is now available for download. Um, more than 600,000 people have already downloaded the app, so if you are one of those, thank you for doing so. But for the app to be as effective as possible uh, to help us in the fight against COVID and also help us live a bit more normally, then we need as many people as possible across Scotland to download it and use it. So if you haven't yet done so, you can download it via the protect.scot website. You'll see that uh, on the front of the podium. Uh, or you can go to the Apple or Google Play app stores and simply search Protect Scotland and you'll find the app there. The process for downloading it is really quick and simple. You don't need to provide any personal information. And the way that the app works is also really simple. If you test positive for COVID, uh, you will be given a code by Test and Protect that you will enter into the app. And once you do that, the app automatically identifies any other app users that you've been in close proximity with. And that means anyone you have been within two metres of uh, for more than 15 minutes within a, a particular time scale. Uh, the app will then immediately alert those people that a contact of theirs has tested positive, uh, though they won't know who that is and it will provide them with information and links to advice on self-isolating. And similarly, uh, you will receive an alert if a contact of yours has tested positive, but again, you won't know who they are. Everything about the app is anonymous and confidential. It doesn't replace the current test and protect system. Instead, it is an enhancement of that. And it will be particularly useful for settings like public transport, where we tend to spend time in close proximity to people we don't know. So we wouldn't be able to give the details of these people to a contact tracer who telephones us. We also think it will be very valuable as students start to arrive back at college and university. So if you are a student about to uh, go to college or uni, uh, make sure you download the app because it will help with you having a bit of normality into how you go about your daily lives. And if you have uh, relatives that are about to start college or uni, make sure you remind them to go on and download it. And one of the crucial uh, things about it is that it helps to reduce the time it takes to notify contacts. If you think about it, our manual contact tracing system is excellent. It's doing a great job. Uh, but by definition, the time taken to phone somebody, take the details of them and then contact uh, those people takes a bit of time. Uh, by contrast, the app provides contacts with an almost immediate notification, which will then be supplemented by advice as necessary from the Test and Protect team. So for all these reasons, and I really want to stress this, this app is a really important way 
in which all of us can support Test and Protect in the efforts uh, that they are making, but also a really important way for all of us to keep our communities safe. Um, I know Nicola will talk a bit more about this shortly, but in the face of COVID, we can all feel a little bit you know, powerless right now, but this is a way of us doing something positive that helps in that collective effort. And let me just stress again, because I know there are some people, understandably, that have concerns about any technology. Uh, this app has been designed with privacy absolutely in mind. It's anonymous and confidential, as I said a moment ago. It doesn't track uh, your movements. It doesn't know where you are or, or track your location. Um, apart from the, the, the most minimal of data, it needs to work. It doesn't collect or pass on data. Your data won't be passed to the DWP or the HMRC or anybody else. Somebody like me can't go and look at anything about you um, because it doesn't identify you personally at all. Um, so it's a really good innovation and a good enhancement of this vital test and protect system that as we go into winter becomes ever more important. And I'll come back to the simple fact I started with. The, the sign-up rate that we saw yesterday and overnight and into today is excellent, probably beyond our initial expectations. But we've got to keep that going. We've got to keep the numbers growing because the more of us who download and use it, the more effective this app will be and the more effective Test and Protect will be overall in helping us to tackle COVID. So uh, I would encourage you to visit protect.scot, download the app today and spread the word to all of your family and friends as well. It's a really simple thing we can do, but it's a really important thing all of us can do as individual citizens to help protect Scotland as a whole. The second issue I want to highlight um, are the new rules and guidelines that were announced yesterday. And particularly, I want to emphasise the new rules on social gatherings. Now, you know that since July, up to eight people from three households have been able to meet indoors. The limits are a bit higher for outdoor gatherings. Uh, these limits no longer apply. A maximum now of six people from a maximum of two households will be able to meet together. Now, I know that is a, a really tough restriction. Um, that's why I want to assure you that the decision we made on this wasn't taken lightly. At the moment, we believe this is necessary to try to limit and restrict as much as we can the transmission of the virus between different households. Uh, to put it bluntly, this virus wants to find new households to infect. That's pretty much all it cares about. And to survive, it has to transmit from person to person and household to household. So in order uh, to push it into retreat, as we did over the summer, we have to limit the opportunities for it to spread between households. Uh, whether this virus thrives or dies is down to the opportunities we give it or deny it. So to reduce transmission and also to simplify the rules, this new limit will apply indoors in houses, pubs and restaurants and also outdoors, including in private gardens. Uh, there are some limited exceptions, for example, for organised sports and, and places of worship. I also outlined yesterday an exception to allow up to 20 people to attend uh, funeral wakes or wedding and civil partnership receptions. And any children under 12 who are part of two households meeting up don't count towards the limit of six people. Now, our initial decision, uh, for the reasons I've talked about, trying to limit that spread between households, is that children under 12 do count towards the household number. Uh, so children from several different households can't gather together in your home. However, I have asked for some additional expert advice to see if in some circumstances we could exempt uh, children from the two household rule uh, as well so that for example children's birthday parties could go ahead even on a limited basis as long as adults complied with the limits. Uh, we intend to clarify this over the next uh, few days uh, hopefully in the early part of next week um, and that indicates that we don't want these rules to be applied any more severely than they have to be but we have to make sure uh, that they are being applied stringently enough in order to have the desired effect. That's why some of these decisions are quite difficult and we need to think carefully about them. The basic rule, though, just to remind people, is that in any setting, indoors or outdoors, for now, you should not meet in groups of more than six people uh, from a maximum of two households. 
Uh, the regulations that will give legal effect to these measures will come into force on Monday uh, and more detail will be available on our website. But I would encourage people to start sticking to them now rather than waiting for them uh, to take legal effect on Monday. And of course, for now, for people living in Glasgow, East or West Dumbartonshire, Renfrewshire and East Renfrewshire, the advice is not to visit other people's households at all. Now, I know all of this can be really hard to understand. Uh, as you might have heard me say in uh, one of the briefings earlier in the week, at an earlier stage of this pandemic, when we just were saying to all of you, stay at home, that was quite easy for people to understand. Very hard to abide by, but easy to understand. It's a bit more difficult now, and I really get that. We're trying to simplify the rules as much as possible. Um, but the point I wanted to just briefly touch on right now is the fact that I know sometimes these rules right now seem to be inconsistent. Um, one of the uh, young people in my own life uh, messaged me this morning to ask, uh, pretty forcefully, um, why she can be with her friends at school all day today, but she can't be with her friends after school later on. And to be fair, that's not an unreasonable question. But the basic answer is this. Uh, we're having to restrict interactions in the population generally to try to keep the virus at a low enough level to keep schools open, because we know being at school is so important for young people educationally and socially. So what can sometimes appear to be inconsistencies are actually just the essential trade-offs that we need to make to avoid going back into lockdown more completely and to avoid, if at all possible, having to close schools again. Um, so I know this can be difficult to understand, uh, but I would ask you uh, or seek to give you an assurance that we do think carefully about all of this. And while it can sometimes be difficult to fathom it, there is a rationale behind the decisions that we are taking. Now, yesterday, of course, we also decided to implement two additional measures to reduce the risk of transmission in the hospitality sector. Again, these will take effect legally from Monday, but there's no reason why people shouldn't start to abide by these straight away. Firstly, it will become mandatory for customers in hospitality premises to wear face coverings when uh, they're not eating or drinking, um, for example, when they enter the premises and go to their table or when they leave the table to go to the bathroom. And second, it's already recommended in guidance that staff working in hospitality premises wear face coverings. Uh, but from Monday, that advice, subject to some exemptions, the same exemptions that apply to face coverings elsewhere, uh, will become law. The hospitality sector has put an awful lot of effort into making it safe for people to go out and meet up, and I'm very grateful to them for that. These additional protections are all about helping to ensure that the sector can remain open, because that matters for the large numbers of people, of course, who work within it, as well as the people who enjoy the services that it provides. Now, the final point I want to make before handing over to Nicola is that uh, the changes that were announced yesterday I know are really unwelcome. Um, I didn't want to announce them, uh, and I'm sure that none of you wanted to hear them. But in our judgment, imposing more restrictions now on how people meet up is necessary to avoid a stricter lockdown later. Um, over the past month and a half, the average number of cases recorded in Scotland each day has been more than trebling every three weeks. That's not sustainable if we are to keep schools and businesses safely open. Um, so we have to act now in order to try to stem that increase and avoid uh, more restrictive measures becoming necessary later. And the other point that I made yesterday that I want to stress today, this is all really frustrating and tiresome for everyone. But on the upside, we are in a stronger position now than we were back in March. Cases are not rising as quickly, and that is partly because now we have test and protect operating and people are much more used to having to do all of the basic things to try to limit the spreads of the virus. So we're in a stronger position, yeah, but we must protect the progress we've made and try to stop the virus running out of control again, particularly because we've always known going into winter with colder, damper uh, temperatures and, and damper conditions are likely to see this virus spread uh, again more quickly. So please, please stick to the new rules. Uh, of six people in two households. Um, don't wait until Monday, do that uh, now. And always remember the other measures uh, that will minimise the risk of you passing the virus on to other people. Uh, and the simplest way of trying to remember all of that is facts. Uh, these are the rules that all of us, if we follow them, uh, will help 
keep transmission as low as possible. So face coverings, avoiding crowded places, cleaning hands and hard surfaces, keeping to two metres distance and self-isolating and book a test if you have symptoms. Um, I spoke earlier about downloading the Protect Scotland app um, as a really simple but powerful thing we can all do to help our communities. It is, and I would again encourage you to do that. But so is sticking to these five rules and facts. You know, the basic point that was true back in March that I, th I think motivated all of us through really dark, difficult times remains just as true today. Uh, while our experiences are all different, I know uh, that, but fundamentally, we are all in this together. And fundamentally, it is only together that we can save lives and beat this virus. So please continue to play your part by doing all of the things we ask, download the app uh, and comply with the facts guidance. Uh, thank you to everybody for doing that and please continue to spread the word. I'll hand over now to Dr Steedman, uh, who's going to say, I think, a bit more about the app and testing uh, before we take questions from journalists. Thank you. So today I'd like to talk to you about knowledge and how knowledge really is power. So at the very beginning of this pandemic, we obviously knew very little about this new coronavirus, and I, I think that made us all, as, as human beings, feel really quite powerless. And over the last number of months, our knowledge has expanded at a phenomenal rate, and what we've learned has actually given us the tools that we now use to keep us safe. So that's the facts, as we know them for short, and our test and protect system. But now we have another tool to add to our armoury against COVID, and that is the Protect Scotland app. Now, the key to the power of the app, as you've heard, is that it helps to alert us when we've been close enough to someone with COVID to mean that we're at risk, even if we don't actually know that person and they don't know at that time that they had COVID. Now, to some people, I know this sounds more like science fiction, but I can assure you that it's firmly based in science fact. This proximity app, as it's known, and this approach is supported by the European Centre for Disease Control and Prevention. It's also supported by a variety of public health agencies, and it's backed up both by experience in other countries and an increasing number of research studies. So how much difference could this app really make to us in Scotland? Well, there was a recent study published by the University of Oxford and the University of Stanford and Google that will help us to answer that question as to how effective this really could be for us. And this study actually modelled what the effect of an app like Protect Scotland could have on the Washington state epidemic. And what they showed was that even if only 15%, 15% of the population participate in the app, this could reduce infections by 8%, and deaths by 6%. And clearly, the more people who use the app, then the more effective it will be. And an app with 75% uptake by the public could reduce the total number of infections and deaths by around 80%. And when you add this into a good manual contact tracing system, like Test and Protect, then the effects are even greater. This is obviously substantial, and this is therefore why we want as many people as possible to download the app and to use the app. And of course, getting people to use the app is, is not just about the science. So in designing the app, Protect Scotland, we also looked very extensively at what was working elsewhere as well as assessing what we, the public, feel about trust and about value. And we made a very conscious and a very deliberate decision to introduce an app that was as simple and as accessible to as many people as possible, whilst also remaining completely anonymous, private and secure. Now, some of you may know that we based the Protect Scotland app on the work which was already carried out on other apps in the Republic of Ireland and in Northern Ireland. And indeed, the Protect Scotland app mirrors very closely the Northern Ireland app in particular. But it wasn't just a case of 
putting exactly what was in place in those other apps into Scotland, changing the colour and, and launching it with the Scotland badge. A great deal of our own work in this country has gone into the app. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members of, of our public in Scotland who were involved in the user testing of the app to make sure that the language that we were using was right, that everything was clear and easy to understand, and also helping us to develop some of the marketing material which you have seen and you will continue to see over the forthcoming days. And I also want to thank the, the organisations and the charities, the Privacy and the Human Rights Group, who challenged us to make this app better, to be clearer on how everyone can benefit by using it. And this is regardless of the ability to access the app in some cases. So to that end, I want to say again that it doesn't require the entire population to use the app in order for it to benefit those who in fact can't use it for some reason. And we know that not everyone has a smartphone that can use this app and will be able to or, or even want to access the app. But even if you can't use it, if enough of us, including me, as I've downloaded it, are using it, then that will help to drive down transmission of the virus overall. And that means that everyone, even those that can't use the app, will benefit from this collective protection that it offers. And as a doctor, this concept of protection for everyone was something that was really important to me. And it was also very important to me as a clinician to know that the advice that the, op the app offers you or signposts you to is exactly the same advice that you would get if you're contacted by a contact tracer. And that's including what you should do if you feel ill in any way or, in fact, if you need to speak to someone. All those details are all inbuilt into the app. So I'm just going to finish by where I started really, reminding you that knowledge is power. Please take this opportunity to increase your knowledge about your personal COVID risk by reading more about the app if you need to on the website, but please then by downloading it today. With the Protect Scotland app, we can all have greater knowledge knowledge of when we might have been at risk of COVID, of what we need to do to protect those we care about, and ultimately to save lives. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Nicola. We'll go straight to questions now. Can I uh, go firstly to Ross Govans from STV? Afternoon, First Minister. Firstly, what more can you tell us about the, the situation in, in Lanarkshire that you mentioned and the, the possibility of, of uh, new restrictions? And a more general question as well. Six months on, we're, we're facing further restrictions and meeting family and friends. Are you worried about fatigue in the population and actually being able to take people with you on this and, and levels of compliance? Um, I can't tell you uh, really any more right now about uh, Lanarkshire. There's always a balance between flagging something up uh, before I've got all the information, but I think it's important to be um, as open as I can. There are uh, local incident management team discussions taking place uh, over the course of today. There will be a national incident management team uh, that looks at the situation uh, later on today. And then if there are decisions that, that need to be taken, they will be taken uh, then. The, the number of cases I uh, cited for Lanarkshire, 39, and, uh, if memory serves me correctly, is, is quite a high number of cases, but the, the local uh, experts will be looking very carefully at that in context. Um, so uh, it is possible, um, and, and I'm, I'm putting it no more strongly than that right now, it's possible that over the course of today or into the weekend, it may be possible, it may be uh, necessary to put in place some of some additional restrictions, maybe um, similar to the ones that are in place in uh, Glasgow and other parts of, of Greater Glasgow and Clyde, but we will update uh, later on uh, if that uh, becomes a reality. Um, I, in relation to your second question, um, I've worried since day one that the public, for understandable reasons, wouldn't um, perhaps be as conducive to doing all the things that we're asking to do, because we're asking the public to do extraordinary things. So I've worried about that, but every step of the way I've been completely overwhelmed by just how responsible uh, the public by and large has been. And I think everybody gets it. This is not a situation where it's a government telling the public to do things just for the sake of it. 
This is about basic things we all have to do to keep each other and the country safe. None of us want to be in this position, but I think we all understand that with a, an infectious virus uh, rampaging across the world, as it is right now, and remember the WHO say regularly this is an accelerating pandemic uh, globally, then we have to do certain things to try to minimise its impact on our population. And I've all along thought it was really important um, for me to stand here day in and day out and not just tell people what I'm asking them to do, but try to explain why. I've always been a huge believer in the more the public can understand why we're asking you to do things, the more likely it is that the public will comply. And I will continue to do that for as long as I think it's necessary. It's why I've tried to explain today that things that appear to be inconsistent actually are just part of the essential trade-off we need to make. Um, but yeah, it gets it gets harder and harder for all of us. I find it harder. I was talking to my mum on the phone last night um, saying, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, I live in Glasgow, so I can't go and visit my mum at all just now, uh, my mum and dad. And I actually feel that a bit more right now even than I did earlier in, in the year. So none of this gets easier, it gets harder. But the alternative is a virus running out of control again, and we will all be in even stricter lockdown. But the final point I would make is one I was trying to get across in, in Parliament yesterday. We are in a bit... It, I know it doesn't feel like it when restrictions are being imposed, but we are in a much stronger position than we were back in March um, because we have more tools at our disposal now. If we didn't have Test and Protect right now, uh, we would probably be back in lockdown because the virus would be spreading much further and faster than it is. So cases, I said earlier on, are, are trebling over a, a kind of three-week period at the moment. You know, back in March, they were doubling every two or three days. So we've got other things to try to keep it under control. And so what we've got to try to do is get through the next period of winter uh, with less severe restrictions. That can't be no restrictions because otherwise it will overwhelm us. But with less severe restrictions and these other protective tools we've got, uh, Test and Protect and Protect Scotland. Every person that downloads Protect Scotland is helping to make sure we can get through this with some degree of normality in our lives. So it's hard just now, but try not to lose sight of the fact that we are in a stronger position than we were earlier on in the year. Uh, David Wallace Lockhart from BBC. Thank you very much, First Minister. Um, is it hard to sell these new restrictions to the public um, when it feels a bit like there's now been six months of effort with, with little or no reward? And secondly, if I may, a quick one on furlough. We know you want to see the furlough scheme extended. What sort of form would you like that to take so that taxpayers' money is used effectively? Well, I'm open to discussion about what form furlough takes, whether it is more targeted or, or, you know, sort of targeted to specific sectors. But I think, first of all, we've got to get an agreement that it's not going to end. Right now, it ends at the end of October. And what you then will get is a wave of redundancies. And taxpayers, you, you don't save taxpayers' money. Uh, taxpayers' money then just goes to supporting people in unemployment as a to supporting people stay in jobs and keeping businesses uh, going. Uh, so I think it's really important that that, that happens. Um, and then I recognise there is a discussion about how that is best targeted for the next phase of uh, the pandemic. Um, I, I would challenge very strongly, um, David, this idea that it's been six months of pain for no reward. And I'll go back to what I said earlier on. We are in a stronger position. You know, we, we, we focus really hard over the summer. Everybody contributed to this in driving the virus to as low a level as we could so that when the increase, which was always likely a combination of coming out of lockdown and going into winter. When that increase started to happen, it was from as low a base as possible. I quoted some statistics yesterday showing that we're actually going into this next period from a much lower base than many other countries are. And, and that's the reward of the hard work so far. We've also got Test and Protect. We've got Protect Scotland. We've got all of these things that we didn't have back in, in March. We've also got more of an understanding of this virus not a complete understanding, perhaps, but more of an understanding than we had back then. Um, but it gets harder um, and it gets, you know, if, if we're not to go back into a strict lockdown and there's rules about some things you can do, some things you can't do, that becomes more difficult for people to understand, which is why it's so important that I am able to communicate directly to as many people as possible at a time when this virus is accelerating again um, and that 
this information can be conveyed and I am able to not just say, I want you to do this end of story, but I'm asking you to do this for this reason. Uh, and this is what we think will be the effect of that. So it's more important than ever that I'm able to look down this camera and say to people, you know, this is why we all have to continue to do these things. And I will continue to do that for as long as I think is necessary. Do you want to add anything, Nicola? Yeah, I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to also challenge the assertion that it's been six months with little reward. We have saved enormous numbers of lives that would otherwise have been lost by the restrictions that were put in place and by the measures that we've taken to combat the virus. And, and we cannot lose sight of that, however difficult life is. Things would have been so much worse had we not intervened when we did. And we must remember that. There have been lots of rewards for us. Our life is not the same as it was before the pandemic, but our life is also not the same as it was when we first went into complete lockdown some number of months ago. We are now in a much stronger position, which is exactly why we intervene early to try to keep the virus under control now. We know that's what we need to do, but we also try to do the minimum of restrictions on people as we possibly can going forward. So I think it is not steps backwards. It is an evolution in how we're, we're handling the virus. And the rewards are just things that we need to keep reminding ourselves are definitely there. We need to remember the things that we actually do have to be grateful for, even as things continue to be tough. And they do continue to be tough for all of us. We're all in this together, but it will not last forever. Alan Smith from Barrow. Thank you, First Minister. Just in regards to the situation in Lanarkshire, um, have the local teams given you any sort of indication as to what the driving forces behind those cases, whether it be uh, gatherings or hospitality? And, and secondly, if I may, in regards to uh, Jason Leach, the National Clinical Director, describing the antigen test as a bit rubbish, as it can't tell the difference between live or dead virus, you've already said it's not language you would use, but does it not risk undermining public confidence in testing? Um, on, on the question about Lanarkshire, I, I don't have that information right now. That is what the, the, the teams are looking at today, analysing the data we have, drawing conclusions about you know whether measures are necessary, and if so, uh, drawing or, or making judgments based on the, the, the knowledge about transmission to know what those appropriate measures will be. So we will keep people updated um, over the course of today or through the weekend, whatever the, the, the timing of these decisions might be. Um, look, I, I'm going to sort of give the context that, that I've now, when I was asked about this yesterday, I hadn't seen Jason's comments, so I, I didn't really know what, what the context had been. I now know that, so I now know exactly what he was seeking to say. And um, this, incidentally, comment is not directed at you, Alan. Um, absolutely not, because uh, it wouldn't be appropriate if it was, uh, particularly uh, against you. But we have to decide, particularly in a pandemic like this, if we're going to have the space for grown-up, nuanced discussion, or if we're going to have a situation where people's words are just picked apart and taken out of context and used for headlines. Um, and what Jason was talking about was the current PCR test in the context of a discussion about rapid screening testing. You know, you've heard about in the last few days about the Operation Moonshot trying to get to a position where we have tests available that people could do every day, they would get the results in 15 minutes. And what he was effectively saying is that the current test, because of the limitations of the test, it's a very good test, highly specific, highly sensitive, uh, but it has limitations. And you've heard us talking about them endless times over the last few months, mean that it wouldn't be appropriate in that context. So that's what he was talking about. He used language that, yeah, maybe uh, Jason's not a politician. Um, he's a very good uh, public health expert and uh, has done an excellent job in communicating some very difficult messages. So maybe, you know, maybe it's language that would have been better expressed differently, but that's what he was talking about. And I think, as I say, we have to have the ability in a situation like this to actually deal with concepts and complex arguments uh, rather than you know, here's a word somebody used and isn't that, isn't that terrible. But anyway, I, I, that, as I, I said, that wasn't uh, directed at you, Alan, because it is a, a legitimate uh, question. Do you want to say any more about the test and, the, uh, and why it's not rubbish? 
<laughs> Certainly. Uh, I will say one thing first about, about Professor Leach, which is that he's a very passionate clinician who I think has been taken out of context and effectively misquoted here, which is not what any of us want and which is, is really not fair. Um, all tests are contextual. All tests are dependent upon the population that you test, how you use them, um, what you use the result to, to allow you to do or not allow you to do. Some are used for diagnosis, specifically when people have symptoms. Some are used as screening tests. And the, um, the characteristics of those two different types of tests will differ. And so uh, Testing is not, you know, just one homogenous thing. It's it's lots of different things together, and to try to get those subtleties across can be can be very difficult. And and Jason has done a very good job of communicating um, in a very honest and clear way with with the public, which is why I think his you know his language is is used absolutely to be able to communicate and to reach the public in a way that they can understand. The test themselves. We all want a rapid test. We all want something that is highly sensitive, highly specific, and that gives us an answer in seconds or minutes. And we all hope that that will come. And that is what we really need for this mass testing or moonshot type approach. It's not there yet, which is exactly what Jason was trying to get across. And our current test is very good for diagnosis, not so good for doing screening simply because it needs to go to a laboratory it has a certain amount of turnaround time for that reason it's not rapid that doesn't mean those won't come they will but the current test is not suitable for that circumstance and that's exactly what he was trying to say and that's exactly what we would all agree with right, uh, from global First Minister, just firstly on Lanarkshire, has concern been growing there for some time or is this something that's just come up in the last 24 hours? And also uh, on the Protect Scotland app, I know the Deputy Chief Medical Officer spoken uh, about accessibility today, uh, but one MSP has said that health inequality may increase as people who have old phones or can't afford a smartphone uh, won't get the benefits of this technology. So what do you make of that claim and what would you say to those people affected? Um, firstly, on uh, Lanarkshire, we've been, as you've probably heard me say, over the course of the last couple of weeks when we've had uh, a particularly challenging situation in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, that we've been looking at Lanarkshire very carefully. And um, I think this is earlier this week when we extended the Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, restrictions to two additional local authority areas. We looked carefully at Lanarkshire, North and South at that point, and at that point uh, the judgment was additional restrictions were not necessary. Uh, the situation has clearly continued to evolve over the course of the week and there is heightened concern today. Um, I, I'm referring to this right now to flag it up for people living in those areas um, and to obviously encourage them to be very vigilant and to continue to comply with all the rules, but to also signal we're going into a weekend and, and signalling that it is possible that we may see some announcements uh, concerning Lanarkshire later on. But I can't go any further than that right now because it's important to allow the public health teams to do their work, do their analysis and then make whatever recommendations uh, they will make. Um, on the, the point about the app, Nicola may want to say a word about this as well. I think, you know, you, you will never get in any population 100% ability for somebody to use a piece of technology like this. But we know the majority of people are able uh, to, to download something like this. I think those kind of concerns would be more valid if the app was the totality of our test and trace system. Um, and if you remember way back, I said, and, and the Scottish Government took this decision very deliberately, we were going to build tests and protect from the bottom up based on traditional manual contact tracing. And that still remains and always will remain the bedrock of our system. This is an enhancement to that. Um, and so if, if you can't use the app for whatever reason, our test and protect system is still there to protect you. And also because of the way this will work, the more of us who do use it, who are able to use it, the more protection we will give other people. So this is an enhancement to a system. It's not the entirety of that system. And I think it's important to understand that context. Thank you. I think those points are very well made and I would agree entirely with you, First Minister. I think 
The other thing to say is that uh, with, with all of the, th the ways that we try to combat COVID, there will be people who are not able to undertake those or benefit from them. If we even look, like, look at something like face coverings, there's a section of the population who are not able to wear face coverings and therefore can't have that particular element of protection. And that's why we have all these things in our armory. So we have facts, all of those measures, we also have test and protect, so that everyone can try to benefit from as many of those as they possibly can individually. But this is a collective endeavour. And uh, Protect Scotland, the app, is part of that. And those of us who are able to use it should be doing that in order to benefit those who actually can't. So this is, this is absolutely a collective and a population endeavour that those of us who can do that will do it to drive down transmission, which will protect people who can't use the app. So we can help to actually uh, reduce any of those perceived inequalities. Uh, just on the, a, a point of fact, there is going to be an equalities impact assessment, which it, it's an interim in, uh, equalities impact assessment on the app, which will be published next week. So that will give more detail. We are very aware uh, of, of any question of this um, contributing to inequalities. So I think uh, we, we all just need to uh, look out for each other and try to use this community collective endeavour to protect those people who aren't able to use just this particular element of our armoury against coronavirus. Thank you. Um, Neil Pruden from Kiev. Thanks, First Minister. Uh, on the UK government's plans for the mass rollout of rapid testing, which they're calling Operation Moonshot, I was wondering if there'd been any further discussions with the Scottish government about that. I think you'd said earlier there was a uh, a pilot uh, underway and how feasible do you think it is that something like this could be in place by Christmas? Um, Nicola's already covered some of the technological aspects of this and she may want to, to expand on that. We, we are engaging with the UK government on an ongoing basis. The pilots are in England um, but we are very hooked into these discussions. I think just to, to summarise this, we are all all of us are desperate for the scientific developments that get us out of the situation we're in right now. We hope there'll be a vaccine soon. We hope that this kind of rapid screening testing will open the door to more normal living. We hope for better treatments. And, and you know, the best brains in the world are beavering away in all of these things. Um, so there's a lot of optimism about where science might take us, hopefully in the not too distant future. But we've also got to be realistic that on most of these things, the science is not quite there yet. And you know, on the rapid testing, the technology is not yet there that would allow this, you know, somebody to, to take a test on a morning, get, you know, an instant result and be able to judge whether they can go to work that day or not. I would love to think that was possible, but it's not possible right now, um, scientifically. And of course, once it is possible, as it hopefully will be scientifically, we'll have to work out how that logistically is done. So we're all really, really... Um, focused on trying to get these advances as quickly as possible. But really, right now, the most important thing I can do, while I know I'm not the person that's going to develop the rapid testing uh, approach, I know the best people are working on that. My job right now is to make sure the test we do have is being used to best effect, that people um, are getting access to that test, that we are using technology we do have, like the app, to, to make sure... People are identified quickly if they have the virus and can self-isolate. So let's, while we, while we look at Moonshot, which I absolutely am in agreement we should do, let's also focus on the basics of what we need to do with what we have right now. Well, I'll get to that, if I may. There are many different elements to this, this mass testing proposal, the Moonshot proposal, some of which we're actually doing already, so it's important to be aware of that. One element of this proposal is uh, increasing the number of cases that we try to find, so enhanced case finding. And that's at the very, uh, at the very heart of our testing strategy in, in Scotland. And so that is a part that we are concentrating on uh, really already, and that's, that's in hand, that's, that's part and parcel of what we're doing. The other bit of Moonshot which people have, have focused on is this mass testing, perhaps to allow people to be able to live a more normal life. And that's the bit where the really rapid technology that we don't have yet is needed. And absolutely, we are round the table in all of these plans. Because for this 
to be able to work. It's likely, if it comes to pass, that it, it should be and will be a UK-wide endeavour. And we are absolutely ready and willing to collaborate and to help with that in any way that we possibly can. If we can contribute to pilots as they are taking place in Scotland, then we will. However, we will always have the best interests of the people at Scotland at heart. And what we can't do is detract from our current endeavours and our current fight of the virus, which is here, in order to undertake other things which may or may not come to pass. So our first priority is getting the virus back under control here and getting the people with symptoms tested in, a, in as easy a way as we possibly can and reducing transmission of the virus by isolating. And if we can do other things as well as that, then absolutely we certainly will. We hope, as we all do, that this mass testing proposal will allow us to get some kind of normality of life back and we are supportive of that as a concept but we can't lose sight of what we're doing at present. Thanks. Uh, Andrew Learmans from The National. Uh, thanks, First Minister. Can I get your response to the news that the BBC has decided to stop regular live broadcasting of these briefings? Um, Donald McCaskill, secondly, Donald McCaskill from Scottish Care says it's a change in practice disproportionately affecting older persons and those with disabilities. Uh, will you be raising this with the BBC? Are you now worried about reaching some of these, these more vulnerable communities? Well... I mean, let me start with, and, and I suppose preface my answer here with the obvious point, what is broadcast on the BBC is a matter for the BBC. It's not up to me as a politician, and that, you know, it's a pretty fundamental principle in, in any democracy. Um, that said, these uh, briefings and the televising of these briefings, I think at a time like this, have been a public service, and the BBC is a public service broadcaster. Uh, the televisation of these briefings have been important in allowing me to communicate information and advice directly. And also, uh, to go back to a point I made earlier on, giving us the opportunity to explain the reasoning and rationale behind the decisions we're taking and the things we're asking people to do. And as I said earlier on, I've always thought during this that the more people can understand why they're being asked to restrict their lives in certain ways, the more likely it is that they're going to comply with that. And I think that principle generally has served Scotland well over uh, the past few months. Um, we are clearly now at a point where the virus is accelerating again. We are going into winter. So it becomes more important, not less important, over this next period for me to be able to continue that very direct communication. Um, these briefings will always be broadcast on Scottish Government channels, so they will always be available for people to see. But not everybody, and it's a point we've uh, been asked about and talked about in relation to the Protect Scotland app, not everybody is as hooked into the internet and technology as some of us are. And, and what has struck me over uh, the period that these briefings have been televised, and this is reflected in my mailbag, that is that they have been particularly important to certain sections of the population that maybe don't routinely go onto the internet or watch things on their phones. And, and that is older people who I think have, have really found the, the source of information important. I think it has been uh, particularly important to uh, people with disabilities, perhaps people with hearing uh, impairment. We've had you know, fantastic BSL translation uh, throughout all of this. Um, I know it was important um, over uh, an earlier period and perhaps still is for people in the shielded category and again disproportionately older, more vulnerable people. Um, so look, that all brings me back, I suppose, to the point I made at the outset. Um, what is broadcast on the BBC is a matter for the BBC, but we are in uh, unique circumstances right now and the ability uh, for me and for my colleagues to communicate directly with the public has never been more important than it is right now. These are not political. I, I, I've always taken great care to try to not stray into political territory. I am not saying I've never slipped up. I'm, I am fallible. Uh, but I've always recognised my responsibility to keep these briefings very much on topic because I want people, regardless of their politics, to, to be able to listen and hear um, the, the messages that are so important. So, you know, it's for the BBC. All I would ask is that they take all of that into account in the decisions that they make. Chris Musson from The Sun. 
Thanks, Mr. Um, can you just explain why the number six? Can you explain the logic and evidence behind that number? And um, also, I think you mentioned earlier on that um, children under 12 don't count towards a six, but I think you said they can't be from multiple households. Can I just check what that means in practice? Like, does it mean that two families of two adults and two children, so eight people, can't meet, but two families of two adults and one child, so six people, could meet? Um, look, the, in terms of the number six, um, there is always a degree of arbitrariness around this. I'm going to be really frank with people. There is not an exact science for six versus four versus eight. We try to, what we have to do right now is limit people's interactions so that we slow down the spread of the virus. Because if it speeds up too much, we'll find ourselves in a position of having to close things down again. And particularly schools, we don't want to do that. So that is the situation. We know that uh, transmission within houses is a particular risk. You know, it's not hard to understand that. People, and I, I know this from my own experience, you're less inhibited in your own home with your family, so you're less likely to remember all the things that we otherwise need to do to try to break transmission. Uh, we try to uh, have a number that is low enough to, to give that the desired effect, but large enough to allow two families or, or some members of two families to meet together. It's not perfect. I, I wish there was some straightforward, simple science that answered all these questions for us. On the children, um, so basically, um, the rule as, as now is only two households, uh, but if it was two households with uh, a number of children under, or some children under 12, that if they were all included would take the number above six, uh, the children under 12 don't count to the six. Now, I'm not going to do all the calculations in my head standing here of, of different family units, but if if you had a family uh, that, if if you had uh, two families, and, and if in total they came to eight, uh, but two of them were under 12, uh, then they could still meet together because the two under 12s don't count towards that overall uh, limit. But what we don't want to, to say is, or what we haven't so far wanted to say, is that you can have any number of children under 12 from any number of households because that then defeats the purpose of trying to limit the household interaction. If you had, you know, 10 kids from 10 different households, even if you only had two adults, they could then potentially be transmitting the infection to 10 different households. Now, um, we also understand, though, that this is so difficult for people and things like kids' birthdays, birthday parties, nobody wants to see these not taking place if we can avoid it. That's why I've asked for some further advice to say, look, would it make that much difference if we said if your kid's 10th birthday, uh, could they have, you know, a few more children there, even if they're from more than two households? Um, and I've asked for that advice, and if, if the advice comes back and said, you know what, First Minister, that in the grand scheme of things won't make that much difference, we'll give that go-ahead. But if the advice is, actually, that is going to make a difference and will make it harder for us to keep schools open, that may be a different conclusion. We're trying to work through all of this as fairly, as logically, as rationally as we can. But at times, and that's what I was trying to explain earlier on, some of this will seem inconsistent, but what... What appears to be inconsistencies are just essential trade-offs. It's like to go back to my niece's query of me this morning. Um, you know, why can I see my friends at school but not out of school? That's not the way we have to look at it. It's because we are not permitting you to see them out of school that we're keeping the virus low enough to allow you to see them at school. And this is difficult for people to get, um, and it's difficult to stand up here and try to explain, but we're, we're just trying to keep this as low as possible so that we don't have to go into even uh, more strict conditions. Scott McNabb from the Scotsman. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, First Minister. Um, with the halt to the return of um, offices and workplaces which you um, laid out yesterday, business leaders have called for a, a dedicated um, fund, a Scottish fund to support firms hit by local lockdowns as they have south of the border. I'm wondering if this is something you would consider. And also, is default, uh, is working from home likely to be the default um, position now for the foreseeable future, certainly into next year? Um, working from home remains the default position, and I think we have to be prepared for that being for some time. Um, and 
this again, it comes down to these trade-offs. There is only so much interaction with each other that we can absorb without allowing the virus to run out of control, even with test and protect and, and the app. So it's about how do we how do we allow the things that really, really matter, like kids in school, to go ahead without overwhelming ourselves to the point where we have to go back to everything being closed down and and none of that is straightforward. I had a, a call where one of my, my regular calls with all the, the key business organisations yesterday afternoon. Um, you know, of course, they all uh, think this is really difficult for businesses. I think it's really difficult for businesses, but equally they understand the, the reasons why we are where we are. Um, on the, the, the support for business, we, we've been trying to understand the, the English, uh, uh, the UK government announcement for England, rather, um, earlier in the week, and whether, as would normally be the case, there was consequential funding for the devolved administrations, um, and we'll continue to have that conversation. But we are, in any event, looking at how we support businesses where there have to be local lockdowns, uh, just as we did in Aberdeen. What the UK government appear to have announced for England is similar to what we did in Aberdeen and, and at not, on, uh, not dissimilar levels either. So we continue to look at uh, what can practically be done. I, I make a point regularly just because it is a statement of fact that the Scottish government's resources are more finite than the UK government's because of their access to borrowing uh, that we don't have. But we, we try to do as much as we can uh, within that uh, as, as possible. Obviously, what we want to try to do, though, is avoid local lockdowns and avoid having to ask businesses to close. So the announcement yesterday, to use a small example around face coverings and hospitality, it's actually an additional protection that hopefully makes it less likely that we'll have to see hospitality close in any area. So again, these are all really difficult balances that we have to try to strike for that overall uh, objective of keeping people safe and trying to get as much normality into our lives as it's feasible to do. I think just to add to that question about whether uh, working from home is the the foreseeable future. It's it's for now and it's for the near future, I would say, but this is a constantly changing situation. What I'd add is that pandemics don't last forever. Humans adapt to new organisms and the organisms themselves adapt and uh, the way they cause disease often changes as they go through the human population. And vaccines and treatments do come along as, as we've seen already in coronavirus. So, there is still a lot of hope and still a lot of uncertainty going forwards. So it's as much as we can say, I think, for now and for the near future, with the assurance that as soon as we can get people back into a workplace, believe me, we will. Thanks. Uh, Daniel Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thank you very much, First Minister. Um, a lot of people are worried about what the uh, new rules you announced yesterday means for Christmas. Um, so I just wonder if you could say what your message is to someone who's, you know, maybe worried about which of their grown-up children they might be allowed to invite round on on Christmas Day and is issues like that. And would you perhaps consider a, a Christmas Day exemption if, if these rules are still in force? Um, and also, if I'd ask a question to uh, Dr Steedman, um, Jason Leach was on the radio this morning and he was asked about the whole issue of Christmas and he said the science may have moved on by then. Uh, we may even have the beginnings of a vaccine for some segments of society. Um, I was just wondering if you could expand on that. You know, how likely is it that we'll have a vaccine ready within the next three months and um, you know, which, which of the candidates do you think that could be? Thank you. I'm not sure either of us, but I'll let Nicola... Uh have a go uh, from a clinical but I'm not sure either of us can definitively answer these questions look on, on Christmas I, I know how difficult this is and I know we're, we're, we're approaching that time of year um, some of us like to think we're not quite at it yet in a normal year but we're approaching that time of year when our minds do start to, to turn towards Christmas I, I understand that and uh, you know I, I will hear that increasingly from my own family just as everybody else will, will start to think about that and so what I'm about to say is, is difficult but you know, in, in the context of a pandemic, you know, in, in normal times, Christmas starts to feel like just around the corner. In a pandemic, and the last few months should have told us this, that period of time, what, you know, three months away is a long time. And it's just not possible to be certain about the circumstances we will face then. All of us desperately want to think that we will have as normal a Christmas as possible. Um, and all I can say to people is... I can't give you definitive answers on that right now. I will share my up-to-date thinking every day as it develops. 
but we, what we can all do right now is behave in a way that drives this infection as low as possible to give us as much hope as possible but without any scientific developments that might or might not happen that Nicola will talk about. But putting that to one side, if we all behave in a way that drives us as low as possible, we give ourselves the best chance of having more, not less, normality by the time we get to Christmas. Um, but we are, you know, we are in a global pandemic. Um, and I'm afraid much as every fibre of my being would love to just say to look down this camera and say, don't worry about Christmas, it'll all be fine by Christmas. I would love to say that, but I can't. And I wouldn't be treating you with the respect you deserve if I did say that, because I would be giving you false... I'd, I'd be you know, succumbing to that thing that politicians in normal times sometimes too do, telling people what they want to hear as opposed to being frank with you about the reality of the situation we face. It's harder to do the latter, but I think it's one of the responsibilities of leadership right now to do the latter rather than the former. As far as Christmas goes, uh, Christmas still feels to me like it's, it's a very long way off. Um, and the important thing is that what we do now will dictate at least in part, what happens around Christmas time. And this is why we need to act at this time when we see the virus going up to try to get it back down again as quickly as we possibly can. We know that the changes that we put in place when we try to reduce transmission of the virus again don't take effect for a few weeks. So we are, we are always looking to the future to see what effect the things that we've just put in place now, the new restrictions will have. And this, I think, is a critical time. But my message would be, let's all do everything that we can now to get the virus back down as low as possible as we come into the winter period. And that is certainly what will give us the best opportunity of having as few restrictions as absolutely possible when it comes to Christmas. None of us know for certain, but I do know for certain that if we don't do something now, then we really will be in trouble. So that's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we have a chance to get the virus down before then. As far as the vaccine goes, yeah, I wish I had my scientific crystal ball and could tell you for certain, but like the First Minister, I'm not going to tell you any fairy stories either. I can tell you that the vaccines um, are making very good progress. There are uh, two very good candidate vaccines which are continuing to, uh, to be evaluated. How much of the vaccine we get will dictate um, when and, uh, and, and to whom the vaccine is, is offered immediately. Uh, and some of the, the prioritisation about who gets the vaccine first, if we have a limited supply, will come down to the type of vaccine it is. So some vaccines, for example, have a better effect in the elderly. Some have a less good effect in the elderly. So it all depends on the characteristics of the vaccine itself and how much we might get of any successful vaccine should we get to that stage uh, when they're able to manufacture it on a, on a larger scale. And the final thing I'd say about prioritising, if we have to, who might get the vaccine, is that we've got really good advice, thankfully, for this in the UK. The Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, uh, which uh, advises on uh, policy for vaccinations across the UK, will assess the scientific evidence on any available vaccines. And in fact, they have an, an interim statement, which is online about potential prioritization for a COVID vaccine when it comes. But they will look at each individual vaccine very specifically, and it will be, uh, will be given out in the way that uh, allows the most people to benefit from whatever it is that we have available. So it will all be based in science, and it will all be based on the greatest benefit that we can possibly give to the greatest number of people and those who are most vulnerable. Uh, Mark McLaughlin from the Times. Afternoon, First Minister. Um, I'd like to return to an issue raised by Edward Mountain at FNQs yesterday um, regarding the care home and granting on spay. Um, care home worker was allowed to work for two days while infected with coronavirus because the results took five days. We've now discovered the reason it took that long is because there were UK government tests sent to an NHS lab in Ragmore that, that, that couldn't analyse them, so they had to order a new round of tests. Is this the, the, the common situation amongst all NHS hospitals? All NHS hospital labs cannot analyse UK government tests. Um, and is this 
a, a major gap in, in our strategy that, that you want to fix? Um, not to my knowledge is that a, a, a general problem. I uh, undertook at FMQ, just as the issue was raised, to have the Health Secretary look into, because Edward Mountain raised that issue, but he raised some other aspects of what had happened in Granton and Spey. I've not yet had a report back from that, so I have no more information that I'm able to share with you right now. But when I do, um, I'm happy to do so. But it's certainly not my understanding that there is a general issue here with the ability of labs to process tests. Most of the care home testing right now is uh, done through uh, the, the care uh, social care portal, where it is tests through the, the home delivery tests, the UK-wide one, uh, that are, are, are used. Uh, so I'll, if I've got more that I can share with you on that, I'll get that to you later today, unless you've got more on it. Just can I write okay. on, a, on a general principle about the tests? Um, different labs use, use different tests. There are a variety of tests available, uh, uh, all of which are, are similarly accurate and, and good. It's just that there are a number of different manufacturers of those tests. Um, and so often tests, if they need to be uh, repeated, may be repeated using a different test or using a different laboratory. And uh, if a sample that was the original sample that was tested can be used to redo another test on, then it, it will be. But that isn't always the case for different reasons in, to do with the reagents that you add for the tests and also to do with how much of a sample that you have left after you've done one test. So in most instances where we need to repeat a test, we will try to use that original sample, but it isn't always possible for lots of different reasons, in which case sometimes another sample then needs to be taken, which does mean that the, the gap before getting a, a definitive result is, is long. Longer. So it doesn't happen often. It's not a general thing, but there are occasions when it, it can happen. If, if there is more of an issue here yeah. than I am aware of right now, I, I will certainly be going and taking another look at this after uh, the briefing and, and getting a report back from the Health Secretary on the question. So if there's more information we can share with you, we'll do that as quickly as possible. Uh, David Ball from the Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, is it a fair assessment to say that um, these new restrictions, if people do not follow them or they are ineffective in sort of reversing the trend, um, you'll have no option but to look at closing pubs, restaurants and even schools? And also the review of the SQA by uh, Mark Priestley was due to report back within five weeks. Um, he'll now report back at the end of the month, according to the Deputy First Minister. Um, is there a reason for this delay and are you confident um, lessons have been learned given the indication that a full exam diet is now the um, objective? I'll come back to the SQA uh, exam point in a second. Uh, in, in response to your first question, I was going to say again, well done for trying to get me to write a headline um, in my answer. About, uh, so I'm going to try not to do that. Um, look, all I can say to people is if we stick to the restrictions that are in place right now, we've got a better chance of suppressing the virus and avoiding further measures. The, the reverse of that is pretty obvious to people, but I'd rather focus on, uh, because it's served us really well over the past few months, um, although it maybe doesn't feel like it right now, I'd rather focus on explaining to people why it's really important to do these things. And it's really important to do these things to, to save lives. I mean, Nicholas' point earlier on, you know, more than 4,000 people in Scotland so far have died of COVID. But without all of the sacrifices everybody has made over the past six months, that number would be much, much higher. So we're asking people to do these things for very, very good and important reasons. And I'd rather focus on persuading people to do these things than spend too much time at the moment hypothecating and speculating about what happens if we don't do these things. Because apart from anything else, I think that's pretty obvious to people. Um, on the SQA, um, the, the, the current position is that we want an exam diet to go ahead as normal next year. I would simply make the obvious point again is that we are in an, in an uncertain position. The SQE have had um, a consultation um, already about you know, what is entailed in terms of the curriculum to support an exam diet next year. They are uh, currently you know, looking at the issues raised there and so there's some further thinking to be done um, around that. And on the Priestley report, you know, obviously it's for Professor Priestley to himself, you know, decide that the time it will take him to publish his his uh, findings and recommendations. As the DFM said, we will receive that by the end of the month, and then we'll be able to assess. And part of what we've you know asked him to do is look at all of the learning so that we can make sure uh, appropriate lessons are being learned. Uh, Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, can I just go back to the rule of six? Um, 
obviously, I, th- I think as you, I think people do kind of understand why the number, the, the sort of overall numbers have been reduced. But I think there is a bit of concern around the reduction in the household limits. Um, and I just wondered if you could maybe explain some of the grounds for reducing that, particularly in an outdoor setting where people were being told there's a less of a risk. I mean, is some of the decision making around reducing that based on, you know, making it perhaps a bit easier for contact tracing if there is, you know, an outbreak? And if I may, could I just clarify, does the new limits apply to extended households? And what exactly is an organised sport that's that will be exempt? You know, will you be able to go play five-a-side football with your mates? What happens with, for people who are going for a game of golf or are going to play bowls? So anything that's been already allowed in terms of organised sport, kids' sport, for example, um, you know, a kid going dancing or something, that is unaffected. Well, there'll be more guidance on this on the Scottish Government website over uh, the next couple of, of days. Um, in, in terms of the, the, the number, in some ways, Nicola might want to say a word about this as well, in some ways... The household limit is, if anything, more important than the overall number limit. Because if you think about it, um, if you have six people from six different households, if one of them infects all six, all six of them could go and infect six whole households. Whereas if you've got six people from two households, if all six people are infected, it's still two households, not six households. So it's it's about limiting the overall spread. So it is important to have the... It's hard, I know, but if if the objective here is to try to limit household-to-household household spread, then that's why the two households is, is important. On the indoor-outdoor, one of the bits of feedback I get regularly is it all becomes very complicated to remember what the limit is indoors, what it is outdoors. We've decided to make a simple limit. I think the, the limits in England, although they're... Uh, not exactly the same as ours, uh, apply indoors and outdoors as well, as I understand. It's partly to simplify this for people. Um, and, you know, while I'm not saying this is true with everything, obviously as we go into winter, you know, barbecues and such like don't, are, are not as as big a thing as they would be in, in the summer months. So we're trying to simplify this. We're trying to let people understand the, the rationale. But to put it bluntly, the position we're in right now, if we don't quite significantly reduce inter-household interacting, we're going to see this virus spread faster than we can control, even with our really good test and protect system. So this is about getting that balance right, making sure all of the, the bits of protection we have against this are all working in sync to keep it under control. Yeah, so very briefly, um, six and two, uh, we, we had eight people from three households before, and our numbers are still going up. So uh, it, it does make absolute sense to reduce that down. There isn't a magic number, as the First Minister has said, but you can see the, the argument for, for taking it down. As little as we think we can, we can put on people, but as much as we think is necessary. And you're absolutely right, First Minister, it's all about the dynamics of transmission and how many separate people from separate households could get the virus and then go on to spread it beyond that. As far as outdoors goes, it's it's something about the, uh, the consistency of messaging, but it is also about the fact that outdoors is lower risk, possibly low risk. It's not no risk. So any restrictions that we put in, we do also need to consider about what, uh, what potential transmission could be coming from outdoor areas. And as we get into the winter months and it gets colder. Um, the virus actually likes the cold. The possibility is that the transmission could even be, be higher in, in winter circumstances. So there are reasons again for limiting the outdoor side as well. Um, and the reason for, for doing it all in a one if you like, is we are at an absolutely pivotal time here, really pivotal. We need to reverse this. And all of the evidence from all the other countries show that you need to act probably harder than you even think and and fast and so if we have any question about whether it should be indoors and outdoors or both we should do both because we should try to hit it as hard as we can final point is about your extended household doesn't apply to extended households so anyone who's in their bubble with uh, an extended household then that is is still permitted yeah, that's sorry, I, I forgot about that point. I, I thought I'd made that point in Parliament yesterday, actually, but on reflection, I'm not sure I did, so it's a, a good point to be able to clarify. Um, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail is the last question. 
Thank you, First Minister. Um, just on the Protect Scotland app, the inequality issues were raised earlier. Do you know how many people have access to this technology in Scotland? I think you mentioned a majority earlier. Do you have figures for this? And secondly, just on Christmas, over the last few weeks, we have seen flouting of regulations that's been spoken about quite a bit. Does having a normal or as normal as possible Christmas really hang on whether people stick really stringently to these restrictions and we see us stop, see it, um, people stop flouting those rules? Um, look, I have to communicate messages that are a bit more nuanced with the greatest of respect a, a Daily Mail headline is going to be. I, I can't put it that simply. All I know is if people stick to these restrictions now, there is a greater chance we keep the virus suppressed and get back to more normality more quickly. Um, but I'm not going to get into a kind of facile thing. If you do this, Christmas will be fine, because that would be me actually indulging in that kind of uh, behaviour that I don't think is appropriate from somebody in my position at that time. I'm going to try and treat people a bit more uh, like grown-ups uh, than, than that. But I think we all understand why we need to stick to these things right now. Um, no, I don't have a, a figure on how many people have uh, different brands of, of iPhones or, or phones. We know that it's a fairly high percentage. Uh, we think it's a fairly high percentage that have the uh, the phones that support this. Um, I, I think an, an iPhone... Uh, might not be getting this 100% uh, correctly. I think if uh, all iPhones after uh, the models in about 2015, from so iPhone 6 onwards, support this. Um, the issue with older iPhones, it's not anything to do with the Scottish Government. It's There's a bit of technology in the iPhone that Apple no longer supports that is necessary for the app. But I think the majority of people are... are able to use this app technologically um, and I think for reasons we covered earlier on the more of us who can use it who do use it the more we protect those who for whatever reason can't use it and I, I really would say to everybody this is there is no piece of technology that is perfect there is no technical apart from maybe a really really effective vaccine there's no single technological approach that's going to get us out of this situation in one you know, single bound. Everything makes a difference, so something like this can make a big, big difference. So please, protect.scot, get this downloaded onto your phone and treat it as that simple thing all of us who can do it can do to keep everybody safe. That concludes the questions. Um, thank you very much uh, to all of the journalists today, uh, Rachel, who has uh, done our BSL interpretation today. Um, thank you to uh, Nicola, um, the, the two uh, Nicola show today, um, for uh, joining me. And thank you to all of you. I know this feels like a really tough time. I, I just want to stress that point that Nicola made earlier on, and I've been trying to communicate. This is tough. It is we're going into a phase where this virus is is circulating uh, more widely again. Partly that's seasonal, perhaps, but it's also because we've come out of lockdown and therefore we've trapped it in lockdown and now it's out there like we're out there much more, so it's got more opportunities to spread. But don't lose sight of the fact that the sacrifices over the past few months have not been for nothing. They have saved lives. They've stopped more people becoming ill and they've allowed us to get some kind of normality uh, back into our lives, even although it's not complete normality. And we've used that time to build, test and protect, to get Protect Scotland uh, up and running. So we're in a stronger position, but this is an infectious virus that we still have to battle every single day. So it takes all of us to play our part in that. Uh, there are some parts of the country right now in, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde that are being asked not to visit other households at all. For everybody else, the advice is to limit it now uh, for the next period to six people from two households. It's really hard. None of us want to be in that position, but it is helping us to keep this at a level that allows our young people to be back at school and as much of the economy um, and our lives to be operating as normally as, as is feasible, given that we are in a global pandemic. So I know this is, is tough for everybody, but please, please, if we all do what we can do as individuals, we will collectively help uh, each other get through this. So the things we can do, download Protect uh, Scotland, protect.scot. Uh, if you haven't done it yourself, please do it. If you can, spread the word amongst everybody, you know, and just remember these basic things. Wear your face coverings, avoid the crowded places, keep washing your hands and, and cleaning hard surfaces keep two metres distance from people in other households and self-isolate and book a test. Uh, these are 
simple things that are hard to do, but they do make a big difference as we uh, continue this battle against COVID. Um, as Nicola said earlier on, it will not last forever. Uh, that's the one thing we do know. What we can't tell you right now is exactly when it will end, but we'll get it through it quicker and better if we all pull together. Uh, we are in this together. We're all experiencing it differently. Uh, some find it tougher than others, I know that, but we are all in this together and it is only together that we'll continue to do what we've been doing over these six months and save lives. So my thanks to all of you uh, for that. I will uh, see you again on Monday uh, for uh, the daily briefing. If there are updates uh, between now and then, particularly perhaps around the situation in Lanarkshire, uh, they will be communicated uh, to you. But for now, thank you very much.